The web browser ecosystem is extremely vast, and over the years of researching privacy and security software, writing for privacy guides, all that kind of stuff, I have tried a ton of different web browsers. Um, so today I just wanted to go through pretty much every browser that I see brought up um, within like these privacy and cybersecurity spaces, big or small, and rank them all according to uh, how I feel about them, what I like, what I dislike, and of course, privacy and security. Given my background, this list is gonna come with a pretty heavy bias towards privacy and security. Um, your web browser is probably the single most used application that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. So having one that doesn't suck up all of your data and send it somewhere else um, is pretty important because you're gonna be interacting with it a lot. And security is also super important because your web browser is probably the single most attacked by the internet application that you run on a daily basis. So the dangers of zero days and other vulnerabilities is extremely prevalent when you're making a choice here. I think that's enough intro though. I'm just gonna get into this. We have this tier list here. Um, it goes from S to F, S being top tier, most excellent browsers, F being the worst. I think you all have seen a tier list before. So we'll just get into it, uh, starting with Brave Browser. Now, Brave is a pretty controversial browser, I would say, but I'll just say straight out of the gate here that I do like Brave, and I think it's one of the best Chromium browsers out there for your privacy and security. Brave does a lot of their own independent and original work in the browser anti-fingerprinting space that improves the privacy outlook of web browsing overall, in my opinion, and that really sets them apart from other um, Chromium forks or other browser forks that kind of more or less just toggle some existing flags and call it a day. Um, Brave definitely has been in some hot water in the past for pretty questionable business practices. Um, they were adding referral tags to some crypto links at one point, and they have a pretty close affiliation with their own cryptocurrency. But disabling wallet features and all of that stuff really gives you one of the best private and secure browsing experiences in a Chromium browser that's available, in my opinion. So Brave is a pretty solid, pretty solid B tier for me, I would say. Um, moving on to Chromite. Chromite is an actively updated fork of Bromite, which is a once popular browser for Android. I think if you're looking for an Android browser, Brave is probably going to be the better move for most people. But if you're looking for a Chromium alternative to Brave on Android, um, I don't think you can really go wrong with Chromite. So that's going to be uh, a pretty solid B tier alternative to Brave on Android. Let's see, moving on to Firefox here. Firefox is an interesting one. Uh, Mozilla is one of the longest standing advocates for internet privacy that we have, and their web browser has a really long track record of being a reliable favorite of people kind of in this space who want software that actually respects them, unlike some of the alternatives that big tech companies are putting out there. However, Firefox has kind of been slower than even some of those big tech companies when it comes to adding certain privacy-centric features. Uh, so like back in 2020, for example, Safari was the first major browser to block third-party cookies by default, which is something that really I think Mozilla should have been on top of, but they didn't really fully get around to doing until just last year. I and many others also take issue with the telemetry that Firefox collects by default, integrations with internet services like Pocket, and Mozilla seemingly giving higher priority to new products rather than just focusing on Firefox. Um, so there are definitely some issues that I have with Firefox, but it's still a great browser. I think that its defaults could be better. Um, and diving into settings, setting better options is definitely a must when you use this, but I would say, um, again, a pretty solid B tier for Firefox. However, that being said, hardened Firefox is definitely something that I like. Now, there isn't a specific standalone browser called hardened Firefox, but pretty much any hardened configuration of a standard Firefox install is gonna get top marks in my book. I prefer the configuration changes that Arkinfox user JS provides. Um, so if you look up Arkinfox on GitHub here, um, they have a whole walkthrough on their wiki and explanation, but it's basically just a template that uh, increases the privacy and security of a standard Firefox install. So you can add that and it sets all of the privacy related settings, security related settings to better defaults, and it's very customizable. Um, 
that's the kind of thing that would create a hardened Firefox install. There's other guides and resources out there to making Firefox more privacy respecting than its defaults, but I would say pretty much if you put in the effort to make Firefox better than its defaults, I would, uh, it's gonna get top marks in my book. Uh, so that's definitely an A tier for me. Let's see what's next. Ooh, Microsoft Edge. Uh, I think this is gonna be of no surprise to anybody here, but that's a pretty solid F tier browser in my opinion. Um, and no, Microsoft Defender Application Guard does not make this a private and secure browser as some people might claim. The incredible amounts of telemetry, bloatware, in this browser should immediately cross this off of anybody's list. Just to be completely fair to Microsoft Edge, I will note that the Edge security team has done a few things from time to time, which I would actually like to see other security-focused browsers incorporate. Uh, Microsoft Edge does have a cool uh, toggle where you can set on a per-site basis whether JavaScript's just-in-time compilation is enabled, which, um, if you don't know, uh, JIT, just-in-time compilation, uh, represents a pretty major security risk in all browsers. A lot of browser vulnerabilities are related to that, and being able to disable it by default and enable it if it breaks a site rather than just having it on or off like in a lot of other browsers is a super cool feature. So that is some of the things uh, that Edge works on on the security side of things that makes it kind of neat and I wish other browsers would copy, but a handful of cool features <laughs> isn't going to redeem uh, probably one of Microsoft's biggest spyware attempts in my opinion. And it's just mind-boggling to me that we're letting Microsoft slowly re-monopolize internet browsing in Windows after they failed to do so with Internet Explorer. Definitely an F. Um, Safari. Safari is certainly not an ideal browser by any means, um, but I do think this will be saved from F tier because it is kind of a decent choice on iOS. On macOS, I'd stick with pretty much anything else, but inside Apple's mobile walled garden, Safari's WebKit is pretty much the only available browser option for third-party browsers to use anyways. So you might as well just stick with using Safari in most cases instead of other browsers, which are mostly just wrappers around Safari's code, because in those cases, when you use a third-party browser on iOS, um, you're relying on both that developer and the Safari developers for security and privacy updates rather than just one of them. So not as egregious as Microsoft Edge for sure, but it's a proprietary browser. It's not great. Pretty solid D tier for me. Vanadium. Uh, most people probably aren't familiar with this, but it's basically just a Chromium-based browser for um, an Android ROM called Graphene OS. Uh, I think that this browser falls short in a lot of privacy-specific res respects, um, but it's pretty great that Google integrations, which come in standard in Chromium, are removed. Vanadium just doesn't have a lot of additional privacy protections like content blocking functionality or any sort of like anti-fingerprinting uh, privacy protections, that kind of thing. So I think most Android users will likely be better off with um, a browser like Brave instead, but it's not terrible. Um, it's not a terrible option by any means. I would say probably a C tier for sure. Oh, now we're getting to the good stuff. Uh, Tor browser. Um, this is this is an S tier. I just got to say straight up. <laughs> this is kind of the real OG of privacy browsers. Uh, using Tor browser is pretty much the only way to truly browse the internet anonymously and uh, just having that option available is super important for so many reasons. Um, the ultra paranoid among you can use Tor browser and take your security to the max by using it alongside like Wanix and Cubes, but really anybody can take advantage of the privacy protections that Tor provides. Um, it's a really great browser and the more people use it, the more privacy protecting it becomes to people who need it. And it's just one of the best, definite S tier. Opera on the other hand, uh, these days, Opera is pretty much just another generic Chromium clone, um, but it's also proprietary instead of open source. I don't want to be one of the anti-China people necessarily, but being acquired by a Chinese investment group back in 2016 and then immediately bundling a free VPN that collects all of your traffic information right inside of Opera should definitely raise a lot of red flags for people who are concerned about their privacy. There's other browsers that if you like the old 2012 era Opera, um, you might want to consider instead of this, but this is pretty much uh, nothing of note these days and I would definitely avoid it. Um, in a similar vein, Opera GX, um, it's been popularized a lot by some sponsored YouTubers, but it's just Opera with a gamery skin, um, and for the same reasons, it's 
getting enough here. Vivaldi, on the other hand, so if you were one of those former Opera users, you might actually be interested in Vivaldi. Um, it was started by ex-Opera developers and execs after Opera was acquired by those aforementioned Chinese investors. And it really is, <laughs> I would kind of describe Vivaldi as the Swiss army knife of web browsers. I don't really hate Vivaldi or anything. They support a lot of the ideals that I'm aligned with. They host a lot of open source internet projects for the public to use, such as email hosting, free blogs. They even have a Mastodon server, um, that kind of stuff. And they pay for that all with the funding that they make from the browser itself. So the products, the open source projects and communities that they have are free, which I think is pretty cool um, of them to do. Unfortunately, for Vivaldi, being closed source is a pretty big blow to me trusting their browser, I would say. And they try to weasel out of it sometimes with claims about how Vivaldi is built upon the open source Chromium and some aspects of it are source available, but it's not really the same thing as being an open source project. And additionally, Vivaldi's privacy protections out of the box are just fairly lacking in my opinion. Uh, the pre-built options that they give you at first launch to improve your privacy don't actually make a huge difference as far as like anti-fingerprinting goes. Um, so it's just not my favorite browser in terms of like privacy protections or security. You could certainly do worse than using Vivaldi, I would say, but you could also definitely do better, I think. Um, so I would probably stick it in D tier. Moving on to DuckDuckGo browser. Um, I don't know how many people are even aware that they made a browser since they're most famous for their search engine, but uh, DuckDuckGo browser is a pretty neat browser available on most platforms. It has excellent content blocking capabilities out of the box. Um, so stuff like ad blocking, tracker blocking, that kind of thing. But besides that, it doesn't really have too much going for it. It isn't a fork of an existing browser, which is kind of cool, but it's basically a wrapper for your operating system's built-in web view. And typically applications like that are not as secure as the standalone Chromium browser engine. And additionally, DuckDuckGo browser is an open source. So while I like the effort and I like DuckDuckGo's vision for privacy in general, that's going to get a D tier for me. Pale Moon. Pale Moon is an interesting browser. Um, they're kind of like desperately trying to hold on to some ideals of the older web, which is a cause that I'm somewhat sympathetic towards. But then I tested out Pale Moon and I remember that there is a reason that Firefox moved on from that ancient code that Pale Moon is trying to keep alive. Um, websites barely function a lot of the time and all of the modern security features that are standard in pretty much every web browser are missing in Pale Moon. So if you're using it, I would say it's probably time to move on and try a hardened Firefox configuration instead. Um, yeah, that's gonna be an F tier. Mall browser is an interesting one. This is a fork of Firefox for Android, but unlike Firefox, it's completely 100% free and open source. Um, whereas Firefox bundles some proprietary libraries in it with, for things like DRM. It also has increased browser fingerprinting protections out of the box, and it includes a lot of additional security patches as well. This browser is developed by uh, Divested Computing, who also makes Divest OS, um, which is probably my favorite custom Android ROM currently on the market. So if you're looking for an Android Firefox-based browser, I would say Mull is probably one of the best options you can choose. That's an easy A tier for me. In a similar vein, Mulch is another web browser for Android from the same people, Divested Computing, um, but this one is based on Chromium instead of Firefox. Unfortunately, it has many of the same issues as Vanadium because it's pretty much, uh, it's very heavily based on Vanadium. It's almost just a fork of Vanadium entirely. The main benefit is that it's supported on more Android ROMs other than Graphene OS, but otherwise it lacks uh, serious privacy protections, it lacks content blocking, that kind of thing. So probably along the same lines of Vanadium C tier here, not super exciting, but it is worth mentioning. Moving on to Arc, um, Arc is actually one of the biggest newcomers to the browser industry in general. It seems like a lot of people are pretty excited about it. Um, and Arc, which is developed by the browser company of New York is Certainly interesting, I would say. It's based on Chromium. It receives regular and frequent updates, um, which is all the stuff you'd expect from a good browser. And in the time I've been testing it out, I actually do quite like the user experience a lot. It makes uh, 
the browsing the internet much easier and better, in my humble opinion. It's the only Chromium browser that I'm aware of which um, has functionality similar to Firefox's multi-account containers, where I can have essentially different browser profiles with different website logins, cookies, etc., all on a per-tab basis in a single window, which is a workflow that I really like. I don't like having to open multiple windows to have multiple browser profiles, for example. All of that being said, the downsides of Arc are pretty significant, and that means it's not going to score higher than a D, I would say. Um, it's totally proprietary for one thing, um, and for something like a web browser, I really do feel like being open source is kind of a must these days. Um, Arc is also only available for Mac OS and iOS, although Windows is on the way. And probably worst of all is that it requires an Arc account. You sign in um, before you can even use the browser. Fortunately, it doesn't sync any browsing data to that account. Um, it uses native iCloud syncing instead, and their privacy policy is actually really nice, easy to read, reasonable. Um, so I'll, it does have all of that going for it, but this isn't going to be my go-to choice for anyone looking for a private browser by any means. Up next we have Orion Browser. Um, this is another proprietary web browser for Mac OS and iOS. It's one of the rare few browsers which is based on Safari rather than Chromium or Firefox, which is really interesting, but it pretty much inherits all of the same issues as Safari uh, as a result, which means probably I would usually reserve uh, smaller forks like this um, to F tier because usually browser forks are less often updated, they're less reliable, that kind of thing. But Orion does have one pretty neat feature on iOS, which is that it is one of the few browsers on iOS which supports some Chrome extensions. So uh, that is useful and cool enough to probably warrant a D tier rating. Another Android browser here, uh, simply called Privacy Browser, it's another web view based browser for Android, much like DuckDuckGo. Uh, and there's not much more I can say about it other than uh, what I've said about DuckDuckGo already. However, Privacy Browser does seem to be worse at content blocking than DuckDuckGo out of the box. It is, however, at least open source unlike DuckDuckGo, so I think I'll give it the same D tier rating as DuckDuckGo Browser. But you're probably better off with a real browser for Android like Brave or Mall Browser. Up next is Waterfox. Waterfox has kind of a rocky history. In the privacy community, uh, it was acquired by System One, which was an advertising company in 2020. Um, but then in 2023, it emerged fully independently owned again um, by the original developer. So I don't know what happened there, but it seems to be fully independent again, and they're refocusing on privacy and that kind of stuff. In a lot of ways, I prefer this browser over other Firefox-based privacy browsers like LibreWolf, which will get to in a bit. It has fully automatic updates, for example, it has signed binaries, and it has a really long 12-year track record, which is pretty impressive. Um, for a browser fork like this to be around 12 years, it shows that they're pretty serious about this project. The biggest downside to me is that Waterfox is based on Firefox ESR extended support release builds rather than the mainline Firefox builds. ESR builds, um, for a variety of reasons, are actually less secure than regular Firefox. Uh, they receive most of the security patches available, but not all of them. And the, just being behind on features isn't super great in general for web browsers. It's not an insurmountable problem. For example, Tor browser is another browser that's uh, based on Firefox ESR, and that's obviously S tier here, but Waterfox just doesn't add quite enough to justify using ESR releases, in my opinion, compared to simply hardening a standard Firefox install, whereas Tor Browser, on the other hand, adds pretty significant improvements, which kind of either negate the security downsides of Firefox ESR, or they make any security trade-offs kind of worth it. I'm also not a fan of how Waterfox claims um, on their website that there's no telemetry whatsoever, when there is some out-of-the-box data collection for things like updates. The data collection that Waterfox does do is pretty reasonable in my opinion. It makes sense. Um, you have to like connect to a server to get updates and that kind of thing. But the marketing for Waterfox is still, I think, slightly misleading, um, which isn't great. Overall, I would give it probably a, probably a C tier. Moving on to IceCat. Um, this is pretty much just a fork of Firefox from GNU with non-free components and Mo Mozilla's branding removed. I'm not sure 
I really see the value in doing that. Um, it appears to be pretty infrequently updated based on Firefox ESR releases as well. And it hasn't had any official releases in five years, although its dev branch does appear current. But pretty much overall, it doesn't really have any real features of note um, that I found that make this worth considering over just a standard Firefox. It's probably not even a browser that you'll encounter in the wild in, unless like your Linux package manager comes with it because they don't have any binary downloads on their site or anything. Um, but it's just a D tier browser, I would say. No real reason to use it over Firefox proper. Up next is Malweb Browser, and if you've been following my work, I think a lot of you probably know that I'm pretty excited about Malweb Browser. Malweb Browser is developed by the privacy and browser fingerprinting experts at Tor Project in kind of a partnership with Malweb VPN. It's relatively new, but it draws on the long history of Tor Browser as a result of that partnership, and it brings all of Tor Browser's anti-fingerprinting goodness to regular VPN users. Basically, if you want like the most privacy protections that a browser could give you, but you don't need the network surveillance thwarting features of the Tor network, Malved Browser gives you pretty much all the benefits of Tor Browser, um, as well as the performance benefits of using a VPN, which makes it a pretty solid S tier browser to me. I think it's just fantastic that all of this anti-fingerprinting protection is available in a single package. You don't have to be using Mulved VPN specifically to take advantage of Mulved Browser, but you should be using a VPN of some sort to avoid fingerprinting based on your IP address. So that's something to keep in mind. In a similar vein to Tor Browser, Onion Browser is an iOS-only browser for accessing the Tor network. Being endorsed by Tor Project is as good a reason as any to consider this a pretty good browser. However, Onion Browser doesn't benefit from all the same benefits that Tor Browser does, and you're gonna be very identifiable on the Tor network as an Onion Browser user, which could allow sites to track you, uh, given how relatively few Onion Browser users there are out there. It's a fine browser for accessing a Onion hidden service in a pinch on iOS, but it's not gonna provide the same anonymity as Tor Browser on desktop, so, um, I would say B tier, but use it if you need it on iOS. Oh, our next browser is Thorium. <laughs> Thorium, I wish I had never heard of this browser, to be honest with you, but I get asked about it all the time thanks to it being popularized by Chris Titus Tech on YouTube here. It was immediately very clear to me as soon as people started asking about it that Thorium was a bad choice for privacy and security. Um, it very infrequently got updates. It's very far behind. It's pretty much a dead project, even at that time. Um, it's weeks and months behind on Chrome updates, which has a very serious impact in the real world because right when I was looking at that for the first time a few months ago, there were some pretty major Chrome vulnerabilities that were just discovered at that moment, which weren't patched, and as far as I know, still aren't patched in Thorium. And the whole situation with Thorium has only gotten worse and worse since then. Thankfully, Chris did eventually post a retraction video on his channel um, saying that it's actually not a good browser after there was kind of a development disaster in which the Thorium developer uploaded a ton of um, uh, questionably legal content and furry art <laughs> uh, to the source code of Thorium, which got distributed with Thorium releases, which is just insane that that could even happen in the first place. Um, so very solid F tier. Please do not use Thorium Browser. Uh, I really just wish that Chris Titus Tech had done a little more due diligence beforehand and avoided bringing this browser to everyone's attention in the first place because even before that whole development disaster, it was very clearly a bad browser as far as privacy and security goes um, and is pretty much actively harmful. You're probably gonna get hacked if you use this browser on the open web, I would say. so. Definitely something to avoid. Up next, Bromite. Uh, nobody uses Bromite anymore. I'm just throwing it in here because occasionally somebody asks me about it. Um, Bromite is a very, or was a very popular browser for Android that's no longer developed. Um, since it's two years out of date, it's definitely an F tier. If you're using Bromite, please stop. But Chromite might be something that you're looking for if you want a better alternative that's actually still being updated. Up next is Florp Browser. This is a really new browser, but I have seen a lot of people ask about this Firefox fork um, after Chris Titus Tech again posted some videos about it. I guess he didn't really learn from the Thorium debacle and he's 
out here promoting brand new browsers once again, but um, having looked at it, it is kind of interesting. It's a very new browser, so there's not too much that I can say about it in terms of like reliability or anything like that. And unfortunately, it's another browser based on Firefox ESR. So outside of a couple of gimmicks that it has, it's pretty much Waterfox without like the track record or history. So I would say D tier, um, but we'll keep an eye on it. Our next browser is my Dory. Uh, my Dory, if you use Linux, um, like five, 10 years ago, you might be familiar with my Dory. Uh, it used to be part of the XFCE project. It came as default on some popular distros like elementary OS. Um, but the current version of my Dory shares virtually no lineage with that popular Linux distro of yesteryear. Um, in 2019, a company called Astian essentially acquired Midori's brand, and they're currently releasing a browser, which is based on based on Florp, actually, <laughs> which itself is forked from Firefox. So it's like a fork of a fork, but Astian has kind of gone about this whole process in a pretty suspect, in my opinion, and opaque way, and they haven't really given us much reason to trust them right now. So this is definitely a browser that I would avoid. Um, F tier there. Puffin Browser. Uh, this is a kind of unique browser because it processes all of your web browsing on virtual machines in the cloud, which is crazy if you think about it. It kind of defeats the purpose of HTTPS encryption because it decrypts everything that you do online on Puffin servers, which means that the operator of this browser could potentially um, access things like the passwords you enter, any other personal information you enter, and pretty much everything about what you do in the browser because the browser itself is actually running on their machines. It's not even running on your machine. It's also totally closed source. So virtually nobody really knows what's going on in the code besides um, Puffin's developers. So it's sometimes touted as a secure browser because you're not running potentially malicious websites on your machine, you're running it on their cloud servers. But as far as daily browsing goes, I would definitely avoid that um, the risks of having all of your browsing data just sitting on somebody else's computer is uh, far too great to, to make it worth it, I would say. Moving on to LibreWolf. LibreWolf does a lot of things right, I would say, but it also does some things that I'm not really a fan of. The lack of built-in automatic updates and signed official builds is particularly bad from a security perspective. Uh, a lot of LibreWolf proponents will say that you can get around it with like package managers, but those typically aren't automatic and they also aren't really standard on platforms other than Linux. And in an age where browser zero days and vulnerabilities are being regularly discovered and exploited in the wild, automatic updates with in-browser notifications about them is kind of a must for me. And also, given that the privacy protections of LibreWolf can be easily achieved in Firefox given some hardening like with the Arkinfox config, I don't think that the more privacy protecting defaults are worth the security trade-offs um, in comparison to Firefox. So I would just say it's a solid C tier. It's probably not something special, but if you really like it, it's not going to be the worst browser out there. And last but not least here, Ungoogled Chromium. Ungoogled Chromium is a really neat project in my opinion. It does exactly what the name suggests. It removes Google from Chromium and it doesn't do much else. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't really make a lot of modifications beyond that to help people protect their privacy. And automated official builds are only available for macOS and Linux. It's also another browser which, again, doesn't support automatic updates, which I really feel like should be a hard requirement for anyone's daily driver. But I still like on Google Chromium just as a project for some specific use cases or as a reference for anyone else building a Chromium browser themselves. Uh, so I'll say it's a C tier for sure. Okay, I lied. That wasn't quite the last one because I was editing this and I realized I forgot to include the most popular browser, Google Chrome. Um, again, probably no surprise to anybody, but Google Chrome is going to F tier uh, because it's Google. I mean, to be honest with you, there's probably no regaining anyone's trust after being forced to pay a $5 billion settlement um, over tracking people after saying that you won't track people. Not a good look for any kind of browser, uh, but I don't think people trusted Google in the first place. Um, they have a lot of anti-privacy, anti-user features like Manifest V3 and Flock, which they now call Privacy Sandbox, which is all just 
an absolute disaster for the private and open web. So if you're looking for a drop-in replacement to Google Chrome, um, definitely check out something like Brave, but there is no way Google Chrome was getting any more than an F. I think we all saw that coming. And that pretty much does it. Let me know in the comments if I'm completely off base about this or if you agree. Feel free to have your own browser wars. This is all just my opinion based on my experiences with these browsers. And if there's any takeaway from this video, uh, stop using Google Chrome, stop using Microsoft Edge, use uh, something like Brave, something like Hardened Firefox, or even better, try using something like Tor and see if it works for your use cases.